Yeah. yeah. Welcome everybody to uh, Thursday's plenary lectures and what we start with as usual, we start with the awards for today. And uh, it is my honor, I'm the president of the European Association of Geochemistry and it's my honor to present you with the 2016 awards of our society. Our first award is the Houtermans Award which recognizes the exceptional contribution made to geochemistry by the younger generation. And this year, I'm extremely honored to present this to Kate Henry from the University of Bristol. Kate has uh, developed the use of silicon isotopes in sponge spicules and looked at paleoceanographic studies in more recent years. She extended to work also the trace metals and their isotopes. Kate, I'm delighted to present you with the Hutterman's Medal, and she gave her talk this morning in her session. The second award is the EGA's Science Innovation Award. This year, the Science Innovation Award is, uh, is named after Ted Ringwood, and I'm happy to present this award to John Blundy, happens to also be from the University of Bristol. Bristol seems to be a good place. And this is for important breakthroughs in the field of experimental petrology. This is our mid-career medal, and John is one of the most multifaceted, influential petrologists of his generation. John, in recognition of your Innovation Award, please allow me to present you with the Ted Ringwood Medal. And our last and final award is our most, uh, the URE Award, which recognizes outstanding contribution advancing geochemistry over an entire career. This year, the award goes to Klaus Metzger from the University of Bern, who has mastered the mystery of metamor metamorphism, diffusion and isotopic analysis, and provided the basis for understanding the, for the duration of tectonic processes. Klaus, please let me present you with the URE Award. Thank you very much, and now I'll, I'll call uh, Laurie Reisberg to the podium. So together with Leanne, I'm greatly honored to present the, an award bestowed jointly by the Geochemical Society and the European Association of Geochemistry, the Paul W. Guest Lectureship. And this lectureship recognizes outstanding contributions to geochemistry by a mid-career scientist. Paul Gass was the first Goldschmidt medalist in 1972. He championed the use of trace elements and radiogenic isotopes to study the Earth's mantle and crust, and was among the first to date lunar samples. This year, we are delighted to present the Paul Gass Award to Shogo Tachibana from Hokkaido University. Professor Tachibana received his PhD from Osaka University, where his thesis work with Professors Tuchiyama and Nakahara centered on experimental studies of evaporation and condensation processes occurring in the nascent solar system. He then did a postdoc at the University of Hawaii with Dr. Gary Huss, where he studied a different aspect of solar system formation based on iron probe analyses of the isotopic vestiges of extinct radionuclides. He is thus one of the few cosmochemists who combine expertise in experimental petrology and isotope geochemistry. Since returning to Japan, where he has joined Professor Yuri Moda at Hokkaido University, among his many activities, he has been chosen as principal investigator for sample science of the Hiabasu 2 mission, whose objective is to return a sample from a carbonaceous asteroid. So please join us. Oh, 
sure if Walker's always the best. Oh, yeah, we go all three together. I forgot to tell you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this kind invitation. Uh, my name is Shogo Tachibana from Hokkaido University. Uh, this is truly my great honor to be here to give the guest lecture for the Goldschmidt Conference, uh, Yokohama uh, 2016. I deeply thank uh, the Geochemical Society and the European Association of Geochemistry for giving me this uh, precious opportunity. Today, I'm going to talk about laboratory experiments and small body laboratory experiments and small body ex explorations to understand the chemical evolution of the solar system. In the laboratory, my colleagues, students, and myself uh, discuss chemical reactions that possibly occurred in the solar system and that my, may have been responsible for making the chemical diversity we see in the solar system. So we like, to, we, we like to discuss the processes in a small atomistic and, or molecular scale. And in the missions, we are going to small bodies to get pristine samples. So today, so in the next uh, 40 minutes, I'd like to talk about such small words may tell us something about the big picture. And before I start my talk, I'd like, I should thank uh, all the people whom I know in the field. I know without them, I'm not standing here today. So I actually tried to list all the people whom I'd like to thank in this slide, but because so many people helped me, so the, lo the list was too long with tiny fonts, which no one can see. But I'm so grateful to my supervisors, colleagues, friends, and uh, students at Osaka University, where I got my degree, Arizona State University, where I worked as a postdoc, at University of Tokyo, and Hokkaido University, where I was and have been working as a faculty, and also in uh, people in return sample, uh, sample return missions and in the cosmochemistry field. Thank you all for your help and the encouragement. What I have been pursuing in pursuing is the recipe for the solar system. I'd like to know what ingredients were used to form planets, how they were cooked, at what temperature and pressure, and how long. So I have been looking for a recipe book for the solar system. This is a very schematic view of the evolution of the solar system. The solar system was formed from nuclei uh, formed in stars in the galaxy. And those nuclei, especially metallic elements, condensed as dust grains and traveled in the interstellar medium. And in the sun's parent molecular cloud in a star-forming region, volatile elements started to form uh, molecules uh, started to condense on grains to form molecules, ice, and volatiles, and uh, the organics. And 4.56 billion years ago, uh, the molecular cloud core collapsed to form the infant sun, and protoplanetary disk was formed as the natural consequence of a star formation. Within the disk, uh, various chemical reactions occurred to form diverse ingredients of planets. Such diverse materials then formed into planetesimals, plot planets, and finally planets. And extraterrestrial samples tell us about this evolutional history of the solar system. So they are the authors of the solar system recipe book. However, it's not easy to read, so we need help from laboratory experiments, which could be your dictionary to read the book. Especially, 
The experiments that can pursue elemental reaction steps under realistic and controlled conditions are critical because the experimental results obtained for geochemical applications may not be always gonna work for cosmochemistry application because different uh, reaction steps may control the overall reaction. One of such discussion on the elementary, elementary reaction step was done by Minami Kuroda, my uh, student at Hokkaido University last night at the postal session on the water diffusion in silicate glasses. And I also think that uh, laboratory experiments are quite critical to figure out the scale of the system where the chemical evolution occurred. Not like geoscience in cosmochemistry field, it's difficult to define the scale, the physical and the chemical environments where diverse materials formed. That is why, that is why we have a new quantity model uh, every 10 years. So I will later talk a bit about the fractionation of condensates from the reaction system, which is like a fractional crystallization in the magma chamber. So however, we have no idea how large the system for such a fractional, uh, such a fractionation, so how, no idea how large the system was and how long it took for the fractionation because even the current astronomical observation cannot see directly the processes in the protoplanetary disks. So we hope the laboratory experiments help us define scale and the physical chemical conditions where the evolution occurred. So this is why I have been doing experimental work in the laboratory. So in the first part of this talk, I will talk about the experiment, experiments that I have done with my colleagues and students. Let me start talking about this stage, thus formation in circumstellar environments. A bit longer than 20 years ago, infrared observation using a space telescope found crystalline silicate dust around evolved stars. So this is the infrared spectra obtained from an evolved star, and uh, so to compare with that, here we have this infrared spectra of force light and ensop light. And so these uh, force light and ensop light uh, grains are real stardust. We have real stardust in hand, which are called presora grains, showing anomalous isotopic compositions relative to the uh, solar system. Uh, this is a secondary electron image of presolar corundum grain. Uh, my former PhD student, Akita Kigawa, did condensation experiments to, of corundum uh, in vacuum to obtain its growth kinetics uh, from aluminum and oxygen vapor. And she found that this kind of one micron size presolar corundum dust can form in a slowly expanding uh, outflow from evolved stars before the wind get accelerated. She also found that the vapor of growth is anisotropic. Here you see the growth rate along the M axis, A axis, and C axis of corundum. And the plausible shape of condensed corundum is an oblate sli slightly flattened along the crystallographic C axis of corundum. What was surprising was the infrared spectrum of such a columnar oblate flattened along the C axis can explain the unidentified un 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 13 micron feature uh, commonly observed around oxygen rich small mass evolved stars. So the laboratory experiments have proved that presolar quantum grains are real condensates formed in winds from evolved stars, and that the unidentified un 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 infrared peak is from corundum. So she, she's, Aki has been doing ion irradiation experiments to simulate the irradiation process in the uh, in the interstellar medium, which should be useful to know how harsh the travel of grains in the interstellar, in the interstellar medium was uh, from presolar grains. So now, okay. now uh, let me move on to uh, the processes in the protoplanetary disks. 
The evolution time scale of the disk has been estimated to be between one to 10 million years from astronomical observations. But we recently found that it may have been about 10 million years in case of the plot solar disk uh, by the 10 million years by the complete gas dispersal based on iodine xenon ages of the solar wind rich chondrites. So anyway, drastic change of physical and chemical conditions such as pressure, temperature, redox state, and so on happened in a very short time scale relative to the solar system age. This is an image of plot of a plot planetary disk uh, taken by a Hubble Space Telescope. Although we cannot see it uh, by telescopic observation, chondritic meteorites tell us that high temperature chemistry occurred in the chondrite forming region in the early solar system, which are condensation and evaporation processes. We have uh, real condensates in chondrites that are some of calcium, calcium aluminum, aluminum rich inclusions called CAIs, irregular shaped olivine aggregates, and possibly some metal grains found in metal rich chondrites. This figure shows the minerals that can be thermodynamically stable in the system of solar abundance at the pr total pressure of 10 to minus third ball. We see these minerals, we see these minerals uh, in these condensates. So high temperature processes occurred in the very early stage of the solar system evolution. However, thermodynamics alone cannot tell us the grain size, number density of solid materials are formed in the disk and nothing about the formation duration. Moreover, the presence of these uh, high temperature components in meteorites requires their isolation from low temperature uh, further reactions. So this kind of evidence cannot be predicted or explained in thermodynamics only, and so should be explained by the kinetics of dust formation processes, which can be determined in the laboratory. So we have so far conducted evaporation and condensation experiments of uh, major minerals such as iron metal, foresite, corundum, and anstatite in uh, disk-like conditions to obtain the kinetics of evaporation and condensation. So although some are still missing, one of which is the formation of anstatite from uh, foresite, we have determined evaporation and condensation kinetics. It has been discussed that formation and isolation of such high temperature minerals may explain the elemental fractionations we see in chondrites. This plot shows that the addition of CI materials to the solar composition may explain the magnesium and silicon and aluminum abundances in carbonaceous chondrites and the subtraction of uh, forcerite uh, and uh, CIs may explain the bulk uh, major element chemistry of ordinary and the inside chondrites. And this plot shows uh, the, the abundance of oxidized iron and uh, reducing iron in chondrites. We see the variation of redox states within chondrites and also see a variation of uh, iron abundance in chondrites, suggesting that there may be a metal fluctuation from silicates. So I really like to know if these processes did occur in the early solar system, in what scale and for what duration and by what process. So let me here talk about the condensation experiments of metallic iron. This should be important to discuss the metal silicate fractionation in the disks, which I showed in the previous slide. So the concept of the condensation experiments of metallic iron is schematically shown here. Uh, this is the picture of the inside of the vacuum furnace. We put our uh, metallic iron pellet inside this uh, alumina tube, and uh, which was used to guide the evaporated gas flux onto the uh, the substrate. The substrate of alumina, uh, which is here, was put in a cooler part of uh, the furnace, and the substrate temperature was 
12, 40, and 13, 13, 40 Kelvin, which are the temperatures close to the uh, metal, metallic ion condensation in protoplanetary disks. The uh, gas flux uh, from the gas source through the tube can be uh, obtained theoretically, and thus we can perform the condensation experiments of metallic ion at controlled temperature and controlled partial pressure of ion gas. And this is a cross section of condensates. You see that the uh, ion layer of which thickness is about uh, 10 to 20 micrometers uh, can be obtained in the experiments as condensates. Here in this, glass, uh, this graph, I plot the condensation flux obtained at two different sub substrate temperatures and uh, against the supersaturation ratio of ion vapor. And these lines show the condensation fluxes calculated based on the kinetic theory of gases with different condensation efficiency. And these uh, values shows the, the efficiency in case of one you have, so the condensation without any kinetic hindrance. And you see that the data is plotted near the uh, ideal condensation flux line, and this implies that there is little kinetic hindrance for the growth of metallic iron and all the atoms basically colliding, uh, so colliding the surface basically condense with the quite uh, high efficiency. On the other hand, when we do a similar kind of experiments for foresight, in the presence of water, uh, uh, no, in the presence of hydrogen gas with a small uh, mixed fraction of uh, water vapor, the ratio is like this, and the total pressure of uh, the system was 10 to minus 5 bar, which is also close to the estimated pressure of the protoplanetary disk at 1350 Kelvin. This one, this uh, temperature is also uh, close to the predicted formation temperature of foresight. And so because I plotted all the data in the same uh, figure, so you didn't see how efficient it is. But we found that the condensation efficiency of foresight is much smaller than metallic iron, and the efficiency was about 0 0.005 on average. So iron metal can form efficiently. However, a foresight formation is inefficient. So this difference may have led the uh, metal and silicate fractionation we see in chondrites. And these uh, quantitative estimates of growth rate uh, should be able to constrain the disk conditions that enabled the uh, mass si uh, metal silicate fractionation. So let me talk briefly about uh, my next step. And the as I told you, the isolation of a fraction of a condensate could be important to form the chemical diversity in the uh, solar system materials. And there was a discussion about this. The isolation of a fraction of condensates makes the bulk chemistry of residual solid, like uh, N-site chondrite, discussed by uh, Petaev and Wood, uh, 1998. And this is the evolution of the bulk chemistry of the uh, uh, residual solid in the in the system uh, ca calculated using uh, the CWPI core at the total pressure of 10 to minus 4 bar and the isolation degree was uh, about 0.7 percent in the maximum and you see you see the evolution of bulk chemistry and here in this case magnesium to silicon ratio and a refractory element to silicon ratio and uh, the abundance of volatile element look like similar to the ensatite chondrites. Then here's a hypothesis that this fractionation, fractional condensation may explain the relationship between earth and ensatite chondrites, which are chemically different but, uh, but isotopically quite similar. Nicola Dolphus and Chin Ju Ying uh, have discussed this uh, hypothesis this week. Here's the evolution of the chemical composition of the uh, isolated grains. The isolated component at high temperatures uh, may explain the Earth's bulk, uh, chemis bulk chemistry. So this is like an evolution of the magma chamber and the chondrite uh, 
no, inside, inside condylite may be the residue of the formation of earth components. To understand if this really happened in the disk, the growth rate of major high temperature components such as iron metal and forthright are important parameters. And it is also important it is also important. We have to prevent uh, further reactions between high temperature condensates and the resi residual gas, one of which is the formation of uh, enstatite in the disk uh, by a reaction of foresight with silica rich gas. So we plan to start the formation experiments of uh, enstatite at plausible nebula conditions. And so I have to say these uh, reaction rates uh, should be coupled with uh, the dynamics of the disk. Okay, so I now talk a little, about, a little bit about chondro formation, which we discuss in more detail this afternoon. Chondros are enig enigmatic spherical objects formed by melting of solid precursors during transient high temperature events in the early solar system. Uh, here, here's a, a box scattered electron image of a chondro. And the details of the formation events are not rigorously constrained, unfortunately. So we have been doing lab work to constrain the thermal history of chondrules at temperatures lower than the silicate solidus because uh, low temperature thermal history should have uh, the information of temperature conditions of the chondrule forming environment in the disk. What we focus on is the texture of solidification of iron and iron sulfide assemblages within chondrules. And because eutectic solidification occurs in this system, iron and sulfur system, uh, at, at temperatures lower than the silicate solidus, and the texture, dip, uh, this kind, these textures depend on the cooling rate. So we can use it as a new cooling speedometer for chondrule formation. Here we plot the uh, distance uh, frequency distributions between uh, metal blobs in the, in the, in the solidified iron, iron sulfide uh, melt. And this is a lab work, and you see the different size distributions for different cooling rates. And here is a plot showing the distance distribution we measured from these two uh, opaque assemblages in uh, FEO rich chondri in CR3 chondrite. And you see by comparison uh, with the data, with the experimental data, you see that these uh, spheres may have um, cooled down at the at the cooling rate of 500 Kelvin per hour. So we would discuss this more about in the, this afternoon at room 303. Okay, so we have been also working on kinetics of crystallization of amorphous uh, silicates. Uh, in the protoplanetary disk conditions because amorphous silicates are dominant dust in the interstellar medium and could be the uh, primary ingredients of the solar system. And especially here we are uh, interested in the effect of uh, water vapor. So because uh, water vapor is one of the dominant reactive gas species in the disk. And we found that water so to make the long, history show, long story short, we found that water works as a catalyst for the amorphous uh, crystallization, and more will be discussed by Kodai Kobayashi tonight at the poster session. The poster number is four. And so this is going to be the final topic on laboratory experiments, which is about hydrous mineral formation in the protoplanetary disk. So to ex uh, the hydrous mineral formation from amorphous uh, silicates by a reaction with water vapor. So we are doing this uh, to explore the possibility of water delivery to the inner rocky planet uh, dry region of the disk by hydrous minerals. And uh, PhD student uh, Daiki Yamamoto has been doing uh, quite a bunch of exper reaction ex experiments between amorphous foresight and water vapor. And all literatures predict, have predicted that hydrous mineral formation from crystalline silicates 
should be kinetically inhibited in these conditions due to sluggish, sluggish reaction. However, we found that amorphous silicates that are thermodynamically unstable and can contain more water than crystals uh, inside and react quite rapidly uh, with water vapor to form hydrous phases. Uh, these are the evolution diagram of infrared spectra of amorphous forestite at this temperature. And this, uh, this experiment was done at the high water vapor pressure, but you see that the evolution of the, the change of uh, infrared spectra from here, this is the starting material, but after 36, Always you see a difference in this region. This is a uh, uh, vibration of OH bond in the mineral structure. And you also see the difference in the 10 micron bond, which is the uh, uh, SI, a silicon and oxygen vibration mode. And Daiki has made a model for hydrous mineral formation in the disk. I don't think I have time to explain this time scale plot in details, but he found that, uh, but here we, what we do is the comparison of the hydration, amorph uh, hydration time scale of amorphous foresight in the disk with the lifetime of the solar nebula and also various reaction time scales such as dehydration of hydrous minerals and the crystallization of amorphous foresight. And what is important is, is the comparison between this time scale and the nebula lifetime. And he found that amorphous silicate dust can transform into hydrous minerals by reaction with water vapor within the, the disk lifetime. So he's giving a talk on this topic tomorrow morning, and we hope our result uh, would invoke a discussion on water reservoir in the solar system. Okay, so in the remaining, remaining time, I'd like to talk about the missions to small bodies to get good samples to investigate the uh, recipe of the so for the solar system, of course using the laboratory results. So to get good samples uh, telling us the recipe as much as possible, the JAXA spacecraft Hayabusa 2 is now going to the asteroid Ryugu, which is a near-Earth uh, C-type asteroid of which reflectance spectrum indicates its close relation to carbonaceous chondrites. Hayabusa 2 is the successor of Hayabusa that brought uh, back asteroidal samples for the first time from asteroid Itokawa. And this is, this is an orbit of Ryugu. It has an orbit between Earth and Mars, and uh, Ryugu is as twice as large as Itokawa. And spectroscopically, Ryugu seems to be less heated than Itokawa, and there is also a hint of, uh, hint of spectroscopic observation of uh, aqueous alteration. So we expect that the materials taken from this asteroid with the geologic context contain the record of the solar system evolution, including the story of organic materials and the volatiles as some carbonaceous chondrites do. So let me briefly talk about why the, the asteroid is called Ryugu. Uh, Ryugu means dragon palace in Japanese and appears in a Japanese folk old folktale. Uh, yeah, this guy, uh, Taro Urashima, who rescued a turtle from uh, kids at the seashore, went to a uh, Ryugu palace uh, with, with this turtle under the sea. This is Ryugu palace. And at the Ryugu, he was welcomed by a princess, Otohime, and spent three wonderful days there. And when he was leaving, uh, he spent a good time there. And then when he was leaving, the princess gave him uh, a small box that asked not to open. After coming back on land, he noticed that he spent at Ryugu not for three days, but for 300 years. And he was so sad and opened the box finally. And white smoke came out from the box and he suddenly became an old man. The times he spent at Ryugu was uh, kept inside the box. So this is a story of uh, Castle Under the Sea. And in the Hyopsa 2 project, we will seek the mystery of Earth's ocean through volatiles in return samples that record the solar system history. So 
we think this is a good name for our target asteroid, but you know, we have to be very careful to open the capsule. And these are the pictures of the spacecraft just before the launch. And the spacecraft are successfully launched off at the end of 2014, and it was uh, pushed into the orbit to Ryugu one year after the launch uh, using uh, uh, gravity. And the spacecraft will get to uh, Ryugu in mid-2018 and stay there for about 1.5 years. And for remote sensing observation and sampling, we plan to make three touchdowns to get samples. The, the spacecraft will uh, be back in, at the end of 2020 with samples. And this is a computer graphic animation of Hayabusa 2 at the target asteroid Ryugu. Uh, during the touchdown operation, Hayabusa 2 is going to use this uh, target marker for navigation by looking at the reflect, reflected light from uh, the target marker, uh, the spacecraft will make a touchdown for several seconds for sampling. Yes, at this timing, uh, the spacecraft will shoot a bullet to uh, get samples. And now I will talk briefly about the sampling system of the Hayabusa 2. This is a return capsule to the Earth, and this is the place where we uh, store the sample. And this uh, box is connected to the one meter long sampler home, this one. And this diameter is about 40 cent uh, 14 uh, centimeters. And Hayabusa 2 uses basically the same sampling device as that used in the Hayabusa with some modifications. At the timing of touchdown, yeah, this animation is always quick. At the touchdown, uh, the five gram tantalum bullet will be shot at the velocity of 300 meter per second. And the ejected materials under the microgravity conditions uh, will be stored in this uh, sample catcher having three chambers for the separate, uh, separated uh, storage of the samples obtained at different locations. And the spacecraft has three sets of guns, so we can make three touchdowns. And we also have a backup sampling method for, the, for this mission because the original Hayabusa did not shoot the bullet. We will use uh, this part, the tip of the sampler horn, you see the, the uh, here the structure like teeth of comb, and we will use this uh, to pick up uh, the surface pebbles. So the sample home, which was forwarded, forwarded for the launch, was successfully deployed soon after uh, the launch. And here's a picture of the sample home after its deployment, which was taken by a camera called CAMH, developed by a public donation. And so we are ready to get samples. And then after uh, having samples from Ryugu in 2020, we will analyze the return samples and explore the whole history of the asteroid Ryugu. That is also the story of the solar system. I did, did not have time today, but we have been also doing laboratory work to understand the evolution of uh, volatiles and organics to prepare uh, the return of Ryugu samples. And I'm also happy to announce that Hayabusa 2 will not be alone in space quite soon. NASA will launch a spacecraft called OSIRIS-REx uh, that returns at least 60 grams of pristine carbonaceous regolith from asteroid Bennu, and, uh, which will be launched on September 8th this year and return to the Earth in September 2023. So we believe that intimate collaboration between the two missions uh, will enhance the mutual a mutual scientific returns, and we have been uh, already started uh, the collaboration. So a new era of cosmochemistry may open up in uh, 20, uh, 2020s, so stay tuned. 
So here I came to my last slide. I have talked about laboratory works and small body missions to understand the evolution of the solar system. And this uh, opportunity encouraged me a lot to continue to read uh, the recipe for the solar system through these small words. And thank you again for this opportunity and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you again. Oh, we well, oh. do have a question, right. Okay, uh, hi, Shogo. Um, let's see, you, one of your plots, you showed this difference in the condensation of iron metal versus uh, crystalline olivine, yeah? Forsterite. And then in a later plot, you showed the effect of H2O on, con on condensing uh, non-crystalline uh, olivine. And I'm wondering if the difference between the crystalline olivine and the metal, how much of that difference, if you start crystallizing uh, or condensing the, uh, the, and the uh, non-crystalline olivine in the presence of water, does that difference between the metal and the olivine disappear? Okay, uh, so the question is the effect of water vapor for the condensation efficiency, is that correct? So we have done the experiment without uh, putting a lot of water into the system, and we have no condensate. So we need some wa uh, excess oxygen to form crystalline forsterite. That is the case for the solar system. The uh, solar system ab abundance of oxygen is much more than the, the abundance of metallic elements. Thank you. Any other questions? In that case, I'd like to ask you to give another hand for Shogo. Thank you. His excellent work. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much.